As you're finding your way to your seats, let me welcome you. My name is Steve, along with Pastor Lauren, one of the pastors here. If you're new with us, uh, we're in a study in the book of John. John chapter 20, verse 31 says this. It says, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's why we're studying the Gospel of John over the next three years. We are studying the Gospel of John in depth because we want you to believe if you don't believe, and we want you to have life whether you believe or not. We desire that all of us who come here, who call this church home or come here for a visit, would at least encounter Jesus and hear the message of Jesus. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, there's one right in front of you, and you can turn that to John's Gospel. We'll be in chapter 1, verses 35 through 42 today. For those three or four of you who are doing the homework along with us and studying along, probably all of you, right? Uh, last week, I, we uh, published the text, and, and this is about half of the published text. And so if you've been studying, there's good news. Your homework is already done for next week, okay? If you haven't been studying, there's good news. You have time to catch up. You're that kid in high school. You have the opportunity to catch up. Um, but as I looked at the text, I uh, wanted to, to divide it into two pieces. And so today we'll do John 1, 35 through 42. There is no excuse for you to not have a Bible open because you can see your Bibles now. Thank you, both of you in the back. You can see your Bibles now. You can open it and see. If you use a screen, you might have to put a screen protector there uh, for the glare and things like that. But another good reason to use an analog Bible, you can open it and you can see the text and you're right there and you're well on your way. So as I said, we're studying John because John is the gospel that helps us to believe and live. And the truth of the matter is, is that everyone who encounters or everyone who hears the message of Jesus responds to Jesus. Everyone, everyone who hears the message of Jesus responds to Jesus. Some people will hear the message of Jesus and they will respond with, with a hand up saying, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't believe Jesus. I don't like Jesus. Even this morning as I was thinking about this, I realized that for most people who put their hand up when they hear about Jesus and they don't want anything to do with Jesus, it's usually one of two reasons. It's usually hiding a fear or a fault, or it's an excuse for sin. Typically, it's not just an intellectual desire to have nothing to do with Jesus. Normally, there's something more emotional going on than that. And so when some people hear the message of Jesus, and maybe that's you today, or maybe that was you in your background, we respond to Jesus as a foe of Jesus, someone who is not interested in Jesus, who would actually maybe even be an enemy of Jesus and would discourage others from following Jesus. Again, if you're here today and that's you and you're like, I am not interested in Jesus, I just came here because I heard the music was good and you've got new lights and I wanted to see them, we're glad you're here. We're very glad you're here. We hope that what you would do is just continue to think about Jesus' claims about himself and that as we study the Gospel of John, that you would find at this church a place where you can spiritually search where you can ask legitimate questions and get real answers, where you wouldn't be judged for your questions. And if you ask myself or Pastor Lauren or our leaders here, if you ask questions, you will not be judged for your legitimate questions. And we want people who are here who, who would respond to Jesus with, with a no thank you attitude to at least be able to explore who Jesus said that he was. We would also desire that for some of you who know people who are like that in, in your lives, in your everyday lives, that this would be a place that you would be comfortable bringing those people to. Because everybody who hears the message of Jesus responds. Some people say, no, thank you. Other people would, would search inquisitively. Maybe they're not ready to take, a, take that step of faith and, and cross that line and give their life to Jesus but they would be searching inquisitively and they would have questions and, and they would really want to know about Jesus and they would maybe have a very inquisitive attitude. And if that's you today, I think you're going to meet a couple of people who are, who are much like you in our text this morning. For others of us who have heard the message of Jesus, we've responded by giving our heart and our life to Jesus. And right up front, I would say this, that for those who maybe are just familiar with Jesus or for maybe even those who have a friendly disposition toward Jesus, that's not enough. That to be a follower of Jesus, 
means that we cross that line and we take that step of faith in placing our faith and our trust and our belief in Jesus. To be a Christian doesn't mean that I am just familiar with Jesus. To be a Christian is not even that I just have a kind of neutrally friendly disposition toward Jesus. To be a follower of Jesus means that I place my faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for the forgiveness of my sins and a restoration of my relationship with God. That's what it means to be a Christian. As we open God's word to John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, we're going to see two men who you've heard of before if you've been in church. And what we're going to see is their first steps toward following Jesus. For anyone who decides to become a follower of Jesus, it's usually a series of steps. Typically what happens is not that someone is running far from Jesus and is a foe of Jesus and wants nothing to do with Jesus, and in an instant, they change and they turn, and they're completely a committed follower of Jesus. Usually it's a series of steps. We see that in Scripture, in John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, with two men that you're, again, probably very familiar with. To set up where we're going this morning, I want to give you a little Bible teaching, Bible study word, a little tool here that's going to be very important and helpful uh, for you in your Bible study in general, and it's really important as we figure out this text this morning. As you look at your English Bibles, and if you have a real one open, you can see the whole page, right? If you have it on your iPad, you can see quite a bit of it. Even if you have it on your phone, you can see enough of it to get what I'm going to talk about. So there's something in our English Bibles that some people would call the editorial apparatus. Write it down. There you go. Well, thank you. Thank you. I worked on it all week. We'll call it the extras. There are extras in your English Bible. Did you know that? There are actually quite a few extras in your English Bible. We're not talking about redaction criticism. Calm down. We're good here. There are extras in your English Bible. Editorial apparatus. The most common of those would be chapter and verse divisions, right? Did you know that those were not in the originals? Anything that's not that would not have been in the original documents that have been added in later would we would refer to as the extras. So chapter and verse divisions would be one. How many of you have a Bible that has cross references right down the center like mine does? Okay? Some sort of cross references. When you're reading along and you see this, the, these little tiny letters in the text and then you look down at the bottom of your page and you see these really tiny words that you couldn't read before this week, but now this week with the lighting, you can read them and you're like, oh, those are there. Those are called, for you Bible scholars, footnotes. You get excited about footnotes, you're on your way to being a theologian. That's right, we love footnotes. Footnotes are another one of those, th those things that are extras that have been added in to help us get along in our text. And there's another one in, in most of the modern translations. And they're called paragraph headings. Look at your Bibles. You have paragraph headings in your Bibles? They're usually in italics. They're a little bit bigger than the rest. And they're, they're headings for each of the paragraphs. All of these things are really good and really important. So when I say turn to John chapter 1, verse 35, you kind of know where we're going. The, the, the hard thing is, is that we have to remember that these are not the inspired words of the Bible, that they are extra things that were added there at different times along the course of history to help us get along and get around in our Bibles. Sometimes this can be a little bit misleading. This morning, we're going to see one that can be a little bit misleading. If you're in the ESV Bible, right above verse 35, John 1, 35, it says, Jesus calls the first disciples. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Jesus calls the first disciples. I think I remember that story, the flannel graph when I was a kid, and they had Jesus, and there was the boat, and there was the fish. I remember that. So if you, if, if you have, again, if you have an English Standard Version Bible, and you go to Matthew chapter 4, and you go to Mark chapter 1, and you go to Luke chapter 5, in each of those chapters, you'll find the very same words in a chapter heading that someone placed there, that says Jesus calls the first disciples. Now, if you're reading the Old King James, how many of you are reading the Old King James? Loud and proud, there you go, I grew up on it. You don't have a problem here at all, do you? Because they didn't even bother dividing it into paragraphs, verse by verse. If you're reading any of the other modern translations, if you go through each of the Gospels and look at these different things, they're going to say something different. Now, as you're reading Matthew and Mark and Luke, we call those, you remember, it's a test, the 
synoptic. Come on, let's say it together. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? And then you get over here to John. If you're looking at that paragraph heading in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and then you come to John and you're studying, oh, Jesus calls the first disciples. I got this one. I know this. This is easy, right? We're going to be on the beach, the Sea of Galilee. The guys are cleaning their nets. They just got done fishing. Luke's a little bit different because they're still fishing, but okay, they're still on the Sea of Galilee. This is probably the same account. And And then you start reading John's gospel. There ain't no fish. There's no fishing. There's no boats. There's especially there's no beach. I'm disappointed. You're thinking, what is going on here? So the paragraph division here, right above verse 35, can be a little misleading. And what you need to know right at the outset this morning is that that this particular instance that we're going to look at this morning is not the same instance as when Jesus calls his first disciples in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Most likely, highly likely, this is an initial encounter that these men have with Jesus before the official calling happens at a later time. And so as you're reading Matthew and Mark and Luke, you're going to see some things that are very similar. And as we read John today, it's going to be very different. And I'll tell you why this is a different story, because it matters for how we interpret it. Number one, this is not in the same place. As you know, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're on the Sea of Galilee, on the beach of the Sea of Galilee. If you look at John chapter 1, verse 43... After our text for today, it says the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. They're not in Galilee. This is beforehand. Number two, they're not doing the same thing. They're not fishing or cleaning their nets or listening to Jesus preach. These guys are still John's disciples, and they're still hanging out with John. The third reason we know it's not the same is it's not the same command. As a matter of fact, in verses 35 through 42 of John 1, you're not going to find a command that says, follow me. It's just not there. Jesus says something different to them. It's a completely different command. Finally, it's actually not even the same people. We know that Andrew, one of the first disciples, is definitely there. Maybe John is there. Peter's not there because Andrew goes to get his brother and brings him to Jesus. So this is actually a, a different and initial encounter with Jesus by two of John's disciples who will later become Jesus' disciples. Now, if I've lost you and it's only five minutes in, I'm sorry. I probably could have just said, hey, this paragraph division is a little bit misleading. Let's move on. But here's the thing, folks. I say this all the time. I don't want you to just know how to listen to me. I want you to know how to read God's Word. And so when you open the Bible and you see things that are in there, you need to, number one, say, is, is this God's Word? Or is this something that's, that's there that's it's very helpful? We don't want to get rid of it or take it out, but we need to read it with discernment. And we read the text, and then we decide what the paragraph divisions and all of those things are. In addition to that, it'd be very easy for us just to blindly think that we're talking about the same experience in all four of the Gospels, and we would misinterpret this particular text. So what we'll see is two men taking the first steps toward following Jesus in John chapter 1. I'm going to read all of verses 35 through 42, and then we'll divide it up and talk about it. John 1, 35, he says, The next day again, John, John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following, and he said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. First steps in following Jesus. Number one, verses 35 and 36. We're going to see that these guys begin by by getting familiar with Jesus. Getting familiar with with Jesus and the message of Jesus. Verse 35, again, and we'll uh, dig into a few of the pieces here. He says, those first words, he says, the next day. 
Very interesting side note about John and the way that he writes these first chapters is that we have time stamps at several places uh, along these different chapters. So in verse 29, last week we saw the next day. 35, the next day. Verse 43, the next day. And chapter 2, verse 1, on the third day. This is all the first week of Jesus' public ministry that is being outlined here. And some commentators find it very interesting that John starts out the Gospel of John with the words, in the beginning. A direct reference relating back to Genesis chapter 1, the opening of the Bible, in the beginning. John starts in that way and then outlines the first week of Jesus' public ministry, just like John, uh, Genesis chapter 1 outlines the first week of God, God's week of creative activity. And there are parallels there that John is drawing so that he can tell his audience something about who this Jesus is that he's speaking about. When he says the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, that's important because you're going to realize that these people that you've heard much about, Andrew and especially Simon Peter, were first disciples of John before they were disciples of Jesus. They had been exposed to, to Jesus before they had met Jesus. In verse 36, it says he looked at Jesus as Jesus walked by, and, by, and, and then he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. John, we talked about a few weeks ago, had a job to do. John's job was not all that different than my job as I stand in front of you, or Pastor Lauren's job as he stands in front of you, or your job as you open the Bible and talk to someone that you may know about it. And that job was to point people to whom? Point people to Jesus, right? And in this text, when it says that John had many disciples, but really specifically these two, we know that these men had in one way or another followed John the Baptist, had learned from John the Baptist, that John the Baptist had a message to tell, that John the Baptist's message was all about Jesus, and that these men, again, were following him, but they were looking for someone else. John's message was the same message on a different day. There are a few pieces of, of application that we can draw here. What I want you to know as a church is that any good Bible teacher that you allow into your life must point you to Jesus. We take it very seriously who gets to stand on this stage and who gets to proclaim God's word. Number one, you need to know that I take it very seriously. Pastor Lauren takes it very seriously. This isn't like an acting job, by the way. One of the things that fires me up and burns me up about pastors and, and about preachers is guys who look like they're acting. Okay? There's a word for that in Greek. It's called hypocrite. Okay, The word hypocrite is an actor, someone who puts on a mask and pretends it's something that they're not. This is not an acting class. This is not an acting job. That this is someone standing up and opening God's word and telling you about Jesus. And if you happen to move from here or you happen to get offended and go to another church or whatever it is, please find a place that points you to Jesus. Don't find a place where somebody stands up, reads a verse or two verses, puts the Bible over here. It's usually not a pulpit, it's a table. Put it on a table and then come over here and start telling you about their opinions and their ideas and their thoughts and their philosophies. And you could do these three things and have a better marriage. And you could do these six things and have a better bank account. And these 27 things and have better kids, right? No. There's a place, there's a place for us understanding how to have a better bank account, how to, how to steward our money better, how to steward our families better, how to steward our marriages better, how to do all of those things. But the context is the gospel. The context is Jesus. And so if, you, if you're in a position and you're at a, a church scenario and they don't talk about Jesus, they don't talk about the Bible, it's not a biblical church. Number two, many of you, and we're happy about this, listen to lots of podcasts, watch TV preachers, watch preachers on video, download sermons, listen to those things, read the books. And we're all about that as long as they're doing what? As long as they're pointing you to Jesus. I don't need a following. I'm not good enough to have a following. I'm not smart enough to have a following. I hope I have the character that if I had a following, that would point them to Jesus and not me. But at the end of the day, I don't need a following. We don't need to make the name of Puyallup Community Baptist great. We don't have to do all of the things that everyone tells us to do to get the church to grow that don't point people to Jesus. At the end of the day, what I need to be is like John the Baptist so that the disciples that sit here are really disciples of Jesus and not disciples of Steve or Lauren or Puyallup Community Baptist Church, right? 
That's not what it's about. So if there comes a time or comes a place where you feel like we're selling out because we're not preaching the Bible or teaching the Bible, we're not pointing you to Jesus, if you come here week after week after week, you never hear the name of Jesus, you never hear us tell people that they are sinners in need of a Savior, you need to step up and call us on it. You need to talk to an elder about it. You need to say something yourself about it and say, we're about Jesus, not about anything else. John's disciples ultimately knew who they were looking for. John ultimately pointed his disciples to Jesus. In this way, John's disciples were getting familiar with Jesus before they ever met Jesus. This is an important point for those of you, again, who are here today who are maybe checking out Jesus in the church or maybe one of your friends invited you and said, hey, why don't you come and, and we're talking about the Gospel of John and it talks a lot about Jesus. We want to introduce you to Jesus. We want you to get familiar with Jesus. We want you to know his words. We want you to know his works. We want you to know what he's all about. What you do with that is between you and the Holy Spirit of God, right? Because again, the beautiful thing about my job is I'm, I don't have to be an actor and I definitely don't have to be a salesman. Some of you are in sales and you're good at it and I'm glad I want to be bad at sales. Here, you want it or not? No? Fine, I'll find someone else. It doesn't work. But I don't have to be a salesman. I don't have to be what the Apostle Paul calls a peddler of God's word, right? That my job is to come up and open it and proclaim it. I said, I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. And at the end of the day, that's my job. That's John's job. Open the mail, deliver the mail. But I want you to be familiar with Jesus. If you walk out of this church and you're very familiar with the music that's hip and cool today. You're very familiar with some people in this church. You're familiar with the fact that Baptists like potlucks. There you go. All right, it's biblical. We can find a verse. Don't worry. If you're familiar with all of those good things, but you're not familiar with Jesus, we've got a problem. If our music isn't pointing you to Jesus, we have a problem. If our preaching isn't pointing you to Jesus, we have a problem. If our kids' ministry and our Sunday school classes and all of those things aren't pointing us to Jesus, then we have a problem. Because what we need is when people leave here, whether you've been in church your whole life or this is your first week darkening the door of a church, what we need is for you to be familiar with Jesus. At the end of this sermon, I want you to walk out and be like, I don't know what he was trying to say, but I know he loved Jesus. That works for me. And then if you have a desire to learn about Jesus and to know about Jesus, that works for me even more. And my desire and my hope would be that even on the back table back there where we have the connect table, there's a couple of little books that are the Gospel of John that you might think, well, that guy was crazy enough to talk about it, so I'll grab a free copy of this and pick it up, and that you would go and that you would read it. That whoever brought you to church today would be that person you'd say, like, tell me more about this Jesus guy, because apparently he's pretty important. I want you to be familiar with Jesus, because usually people become familiar with Jesus before they become followers of Jesus. Peter, as most of you know, was one of Jesus' top three. Peter was one of the guys who became one of the leaders of the church in the book of Acts. Peter became familiar with Jesus before he became a follower of Jesus. He followed the person who was telling him about Jesus. So if you're not a Christian, become familiar with Jesus. At least make an informed decision, right? At least let him speak for himself. At least give that a shot. And then if you decide, like, this isn't for me, and I'm going to reject that or whatever, well, at least you've given Jesus a shot. You've become familiar with him. If you are a Christian and you're here this morning, can you point other people to Jesus? Can you help your friend become familiar with Jesus? Even if it's handing them a gospel of John, even if it's just saying, hey, would you like to come to church? Help people become familiar with Jesus. Being familiar with Jesus is a good place to start. We do know, however, that it's not where we end right? So then we'll see in verses 37 through 9, 37 through 39, that they take some first steps toward Jesus. They go from becoming familiar with Jesus to taking some first steps toward Jesus. It says this in verse 37, the two disciples, by the way, m most people believe that the two disciples would be Andrew, we'll see that for sure, and, and most believe that the, the other disciple who's not named here is actually John, who will be the apostle John. Uh, several reasons for that. The primary one, John doesn't name himself anywhere in this book, and so in the same way here, 
Uh, he doesn't name himself, but most commentators believe that this is actually John as well as Andrew who are here together. Uh, verse 37, the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. You think, oh, there it is. They followed Jesus, just like the nets and the boat, and left their father, and left everything, and followed him. This is kind of a general following. Okay, He's using a word here that is, is a, a general, okay, so like they were following John, and then they turned around, and they started walking with Jesus. It's not the same as they were following him, left everything, and, and a permanent discipleship, permanent call to a discipleship or apostleship. This is just a more general, they actually just kind of started walking with him to ask him some questions. You'll see why in verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following, and then he said to them, what are you seeking? Like, like what are you guys looking for? What do you need? What do you want? You're following me. This is awkward. Are you stalking me? Is What's going on here? All right? What are you seeking? And then they said to him, Rabbi, they identified him as, as teacher. By the way, if you uh, are interested, there are three times in, in this little passage where you see parentheses, where John actually takes a term that's Hebrew or Aramaic and translates it for his readers into Greek. That's because of the audience that he was trying to talk to. And it's, again, another one of those uh, textual things that shows us the audience that he was talking to. So if you're wondering, like, why is he always having to tell people what stuff means? That's, that's why. They asked him where he was staying. Essentially, they said, can we come over? And that's funny, right? Unless you have kids and you realize that they're always inviting other kids over to your house and then asking you, right? But that is actually what they were doing. One commentator actually said that. They were inviting themselves over. We'll see why that's important. Verse 39, he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the things that I like to point out about this is that it is at this point that Andrew and John go from neutral to engaged. Okay, so in the previous verses we saw that Andrew and John were getting to know, they were getting familiar with Jesus. They had been with John the Baptist, they had heard John the Baptist's message, they had heard lots of things about Jesus, but they had not met Jesus. Jesus comes by, he gets pointed out to them without Jesus saying anything to them. At this point, this initial encounter, they turn and they follow him. And I think that their change of direction is indicative of something that was going on in their hearts. And I think it's indicative of something that has to happen for each of us as we begin that journey of following Jesus. That there are some of you here today who are neutral toward Jesus. And like a car that's stuck in neutral won't go anywhere, that's you and your relationship with Jesus. Some of us think because we're not foes of Jesus, then we're automatically followers of Jesus. That's not the case. As a matter of fact, I would say that there are more American, quote, Christians stuck in neutral than there are moving forward. And what happens is I come to church all the time. I grew up in church. I came to youth group. I, I, I've been part of church. I read the Bible and all of those things. But our hearts have not shifted from neutral to engaged. We haven't shifted into gear and started moving forward in our relationship with Jesus. We just kind of do what we've always been doing. And I think that these guys, as they begin, these two men, as they begin to take first steps toward Jesus, that their physical posture, they're following John, they're standing with John in, in this particular text. It says that his two disciples, John's, were standing with him. Jesus walks by, and what do they do? They turn, and they follow Jesus. And I think that that's a good picture of what needs to happen in some of our hearts. That we need to go from neutral about Jesus to engaged. And I fear, I, I actually, I fear that for many of us or for some of us that are in this building or listen to this message, that we're just in neutral for Jesus. And we have this idea that because we're not against Jesus, we're not walking away from Jesus, that we're just fine. And I, I've told you this before, but I have a friend named Bill who calls that American cultural Christianity. We kind of are there neutral toward Jesus and kind of say, well, I'm not against Jesus. I'm kind of like, you know, it's cool. Lots of people are against him and I'm just here. And so I'm sure that God's going to give me what I want and bless me and take care of me and I'm going to be all good. But what needs to happen in your heart is a shift from neutral to engage. Now, I'll be honest with you this morning. I don't know how to drive a stick shift. Go ahead. Judge, give it to me. Go ahead. Okay? I don't know how to drive a stick shift, but I do know a few things about it. I know you've got to push in the clutch. 
right? Okay, good. We're on the, you keep the brake on, put in the clutch, and then shift it into gear, right? And then you let the clutch off a little bit, and you push the gas a little bit at the same time. You sure you don't just, like, pull the one foot and jam the other one? Okay? That was why I don't drive a stick, because that's what I thought, and then I tried it, and it didn't work real well, right? For some of us, that process and that line of thinking is actually not a bad idea as we think about what it means to engage our hearts toward Jesus. Because what will happen is that somebody will get really convicted in life and they'll be like, I got to go for Jesus. And they'll pop the clutch and jam the gas. And the next thing you know, they're crashed somewhere, right? They're not going anywhere. The car's stalled and it's ugly all over the place. The things that, that needs to happen is that we need to start asking questions, start asking questions about ourselves. We need to meet with a pastor There's this thing called discipleship that we love to do, walking people through what it means to actually follow Jesus. We're reading the Gospel of John and studying the Gospel of John. Maybe for you, your shift from neutral to engaged is simply picking up one of those little study sheets that we have and starting to study along and letting God's Word engage your heart toward Jesus, right? So making that shift from neutral to engaged is what happens with these guys as they turn and they begin to follow Jesus. We know that the nature of their conversation shows that they wanted more. You guys, this asking if they could come over wasn't just so that they could post pictures on their Instagram and write about it on Twitter that they hung out with Jesus, right? Hey, we're early adopters. We know this guy's going to be big and check us out. Here we are, selfie with Jesus. We're in. That's not what they were about. When they asked him in those verses, he says, what are you seeking? And they said to him, where are you staying? They're saying, we want to have a longer conversation with you than just a few questions as we're walking along the road. It was probably about four o'clock in the afternoon. And different people think differently, but it was probably about four o'clock in the afternoon at this time. And they're saying, we want to come over. We want to eat dinner. We want to have a meal with you. We want to, they're going to end up spending the night and have an an elongated conversation with Jesus. And what I think that we can draw from this is that you can learn a lot about Jesus from other people, but you only have a relationship with Jesus by talking to him yourself. Wait, Wait, what? Are we going like ultra charismatic? We have the words of Jesus right here. We have the words of Jesus, God's words. I can tell you a lot about Jesus. Pastor Lauren can tell you a lot about Jesus. Our church leaders, probably most people here at this church can tell you a lot about Jesus. But I want you to experience Jesus for yourself. And that's for you whether you're not a Christian, whether you're a new Christian, or you've been in church a long time. Because I want you to read God's Word, and I want you to hear about Jesus for yourself. Because I can tell you a lot of things about Him. But ultimately, that's not what's going to change your life. What's going to change your life is having a conversation with Jesus. I love as we read through all the Gospels, especially John's Gospel. We'll see one in chapter 3 with a man named Nicodemus. That conversations with Jesus change people's lives. And so what that means for you, Christian or non-Christian, is get a Bible. Open it. Read it. See God. If you need one of those like red letter edition ones, the words of Jesus... We're not saying that those are more important. We're saying that's a pretty good place to start, right? And read and learn and encounter Jesus. These guys asked if they could come over. They wanted to know where he was staying. They went with him. They had an elongated conversation, a longer conversation. And I love that conversation ends up changing their lives. Jesus says two things in these verses that I think are are good for us. Number one, he says, what are you seeking? Isn't that a good question for all of us to ask? Did you know everybody in this room is seeking something? Just like everybody outside of this room. We all want something. You want a happy marriage. You want nice kids. You want a good life. You want peace. You're seeking prosperity. You want a good cup of coffee. I don't know if the Bible can help you with that, but probably. Okay? We're all seeking something. Ultimately, the things that we're seeking are found in relationship with Jesus. You want hope? Jesus provides hope. You want peace? Jesus says that he's the one who brings peace. You want real life? Real life comes through Jesus. You want a change in circumstances? 
Allow Jesus to change your heart and change your perspective. It may not change your circumstances, but it will change the way that you see your circumstances, and you will change. Because the deepest longings of our hearts, the deepest things that all of us are seeking, are met in Jesus. And Jesus might not be able to give us a good cup of coffee. Jesus might not decide to give us a full bank account. Jesus may not decide to heal and mend those relationships. But the things that we're seeking will ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus. So when Jesus says, what are you seeking? There is a lot to that. And then he says, come and you will see. You remember at a different time in Luke's gospel, some guys wanted to follow him and Jesus said, well, foxes have holes and birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In this instance, he's accomplishing something different and he draws these two men to follow him and says, come and see. And they thought that they were coming to see where Jesus lived, but they were coming to see so much more, weren't they? They were coming to see the life of Jesus. They were coming to see the works of Jesus. They were going to watch the miracles of Jesus. One of these two men was going to be with Jesus when he did all of the greatest things that he did, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Transfiguration, healings that no one else could perform, all of those different things. They were going to come and see that. Some of you have come to see what Jesus is all about, and Jesus is going to call you to come and see everything that he's about. And he's going to change your life. Jesus' come and see is an invitation to all of us. So what are you searching for? What is it that you really want out of life? Do you believe that Jesus can lead you to that? If the answer is yes, then give it to him. Pray. Give that burden to him. If the answer is I'm not sure, talk to us. Let us at least help you see how Jesus meets those longings. They took first steps. The rest of this text, verses 40 through 42, you're going to see some of their responses to Jesus. Verse 40 says this, Then one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew. I like Andrew, by the way. My brother's middle name is Andrew. I like Andrew, but I feel bad for the dude. You know why? How many of you are little brothers, little siblings? you got an older sibling. Come on. Come on. Proud. Like, really proud. This is your guy. Okay? Andrew is now your hero. You can put your hands down. Andrew is now your hero. Because you know what it feels like to be Andrew. I don't. I'm an oldest brother. Okay? If my brother listens to this online, he'll attest. I'm the cool one. I'm the fun one. I'm the great one. I'm the, I'm the want, right? No, but okay. If you're a little sibling, you get something about Andrew. Because every time we hear about Andrew, what follows it? And this is Andrew, Simon Peter's little brother. Really? This is the Bible. We had to go here? For all of you younger siblings, this is your verse right here. Andrew got left out. There were, there were four first, very first disciples or followers of Jesus. We get them in all the lists. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Four. There were the big three disciples. Who were they? Peter, James, John. And poor Andrew. What did Andrew do? Right? Simon Peter's little brother, Andrew. Here's what I like about Andrew. Andrew could be called Andrew the Ordinary. He's just a normal guy. Andrew the Ordinary. In the American culture, we hate the word ordinary. We're afraid of the word ordinary. We want to be anything but ordinary. We want to be extraordinary, just like everybody else. Wait, what? Right? I'm going to be unique, and I'm going to be individual, so I'm going to dress just like everybody else. I'm going to be unique and individual, so I'm going to do all the same things that everybody else does, and vacation the same places, and look at me. I'm unique, and I'm an individual, and I'm extraordinary. And I get a trophy for it, just like everybody else. No. In the Bible, God is always using ordinary people. He's always using ordinary people. John MacArthur wrote a great book. It's called 12 Ordinary Men. I've been reading it this week. It's about these guys, right? The the 12. Jesus is top 12. And just how normal and ordinary they are. And at the end of the day, Andrew is is someone for us all to look up to because he's just a normal, ordinary guy who's faithful. John only talks about him two more times in this whole gospel. Peter, big brother Peter, gets all kinds of airtime. He has to do cool things, go cool places, eat cool food. I mean, it's ridiculous. Andrew, two things. He's there when Jesus is going to feed the 5,000, and this little boy shows up. He's got two bread. He's got the bread and the fish. 
And Andrew gets to say, uh, hey, Jesus, we got this kid with a lunchbox, a lunchable, right? You, you think you could do something with this over here? And then there's one other time when it, when it says that, like, Andrew brought some Greek-speaking people to Jesus. That's really cool. Headliner, look at Andrew, right? Andrew the Ordinary. You know what he's doing every time we see him? You know what he does more probably than any of the other, other apostles? Andrew is always introducing someone to Jesus. Andrew is always introducing someone to Jesus. Case in point. Verse 41, Andrew, it says, He first found, and it, we're not sure, does that mean the very first thing he did when he saw Jesus, the first thing the next morning? Could be either way. But what we know is that he first found his own brother Simon and said, We found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Right? The first thing Andrew does, he says, I know somebody who needs Jesus. Just like all of you other younger siblings, this, I know someone who needs Jesus. It's my big brother. I have to live with him. I know he needs Jesus. If anybody can change this guy, it'll be Jesus. And if you know anything about Peter in the Bible, you know, he's not the most fragile being on earth. He's not the most, like, tepid guy in the world. Could probably use some serious Jesus, right? Andrew brings his brother, Simon, Peter, to Jesus. At the end of the day, ordinary isn't so bad as long as you're being faithful. For the vast majority of all of us in this room, we're just going to be ordinary people. In terms of, of followers of Christ, we're going to be ordinary followers of Christ, living our Christian lives, leading in the ways that God has called us to lead, stewarding what God has called us to steward, just doing the best that we can being faithful with what's in front of us. That's been something that's been very meaningful to me even recently, is just be faithful with whatever it is that God puts in front of you. And don't spend so much time worrying about setting yourself apart, and being extraordinary, and being great, and being the best, and all of those things, that Jesus uses ordinary people like Andrew. And people like Andrew are the reason that other people follow Jesus. Personal, your personal testimony and your personal relationships are the reason that other people will follow Jesus. People aren't just going to magically walk through that door because they saw the sign and come in and listen. And, no, most of the time people meet Jesus through personal relationship and personal testimony. Be like Andrew in that way. Finally, we'll say a word about this other guy, I guess, that's in the text here. Big brothers. They're a real pain, aren't they? Verse 42, he, that is Andrew, brought Simon Peter to Jesus. Jesus took one look at him, and he said, I got my work cut out for me. He looked at him, and you think I'm joking, but he said, you are, little words in the Bible, I, I love little words in the Bible, you are currently, right now, as you stand here, presently, you are guy named Simon, son of John. You shall be, when I'm done with you, as I work on you, you have no idea yet what's coming or what you're going to go through or who you're going to become, but you shall be called Rocky. Rocky! Yes! Don't laugh, it's biblical, it's right there. Cephas, which means Peter, which means Rocky. Exactly. He just became your favorite disciple. You know you should be like Andrew, but you want to be like Peter because he's Rocky. You will not have your own statue in Philadelphia, I promise. But the point of this text is that Jesus is going to change this man's life from who he is to who he will be is a long journey. And I love, again, what MacArthur says in that book, 12 Ordinary Men. One of the things that he says about this nickname, he, he actually looks at it and says, whenever Jesus wants to, throughout the course of, of Jesus' ministry and Peter's following, whenever, whenever Jesus wants to tell Peter that he's acting like old Peter, you know what he calls him? Hey, Simon. Simon, knock it off. You're being an idiot. Put the sword away, right? Simon, when he wants to remind him of who he could and should be, this nickname is a perpetual reminder. You're the rock. Upon this rock, I will do what? Matthew 16, I will build my church. Peter, 
Peter is a constant reminder and a great picture for each and every one of us of who we are and what we can be. And at the end of the day, Jesus is always at work in each of us, taking us from who we are to who we can be and who we should be. Amen? And I love the fact that this random guy named Simon, that we think that Simon, Peter, he's like the chief of the apostles. He was just Simon. He was just a guy. You are Simon, but you shall be the rock, Peter. And there was a long way to go in that process. And I will stand here before you today and say that there's a long way to go for me in that process of sanctification, in that process of growth. And there's a long way for each of us to go. But Jesus changes people's lives. And Jesus will change this guy who is impetuous and impulsive and probably pretty grumpy and all of those things named Peter to one of the great leaders of the early church. One of the great leaders. Of, we have the church in large part because of the witness of Peter. And you can read about that in the book of Acts. But God was taking him and molding him and making him and changing him. Don't see these apostles as these great guys that Jesus looked at and said, well, I'm glad you're on my team. Look at these as normal, ordinary, average men with faults and foibles and failures and all of those things who Jesus calls to himself shapes and molds like a lump of clay and then uses them. And as we read the Gospels, if you've read them, you know he doesn't take, a, take sandpaper and, and, and smooth off all the edges before he presents them to us, does he? No. He uses them through their faults and through their failures and through their weaknesses. And through all of that, he shows his strength. And these first steps toward following Jesus that these men take will be the impetus for what becomes some of the first apostles of the church. Jesus' core group of men. And to end this morning, I, I want to tell you that there are some of us who need to get familiar with Jesus for the first time or all over again. We need to pick up a Bible. We need to start reading it. We need to familiarize ourselves with Jesus. There are some of us that need to take those first steps toward following Jesus. Some of us need to have these responses, favorable responses toward Jesus and who he's telling us he is. And at the end of the day, we all need to continue moving toward following him. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to become a Christian today. I want to invite you to, in a moment, as I close in prayer on your own, you don't have to do it out loud, to admit that you're a sinner and your sin has separated you from God. God, I'm a sinner and my sin has separated me from you. Believe that Jesus died in your place for your sins. I believe that Jesus died in my place for my sins. And confess Him as your Savior and your Lord. I confess Jesus as my Savior and my Lord and give my life to Him. That's becoming a Christian. If that's in your heart, Scripture says that we believe in our heart, we confess with our mouth. If that's you, become a Christian today and take those steps toward following Jesus. If you're a Christian today, thing number one, who else are you going to point to Jesus? Who else are you going to bring to Jesus like Andrew? Or like Peter, maybe you need Jesus to start doing some serious work of taking you from being a Simon to being a Peter. Maybe you, your heart needs to get shifted out of neutral and into drive. And you need to do business with Jesus and let him at, take those next steps with you. And I would say all of those things are things that are between you and God and things that we would love to help you with. Things that we would love to to help walk through with you. Only you can choose what it is that God wants you to do.